so welcome everyone to debating outside the box and this is an attempt to not necessarily teach but give tools for improvement on how to bring out more creative argumentation in the world. I think that many times this is something that people aspire to do and I think that over the years I've developed certain techniques or methods that have helped me come up with really creative arguments or at least arguments that judges found creative and I think that this could be a useful tool in the debate. Uh, and what, what I mean by that is something that would be interesting, something that other teams cannot foresee, something that has more of an entertaining value and all in all I think something that can help with. Now, when I talk about creative arguments, I think there are two main methods of looking at what it means being creative. First of all, you can be creative in the sense of what kind of things do you want to prove? You bring a new angle to the debate, which is creative. You find a new clash in the debate that is creative. Or otherwise, you can be creative in the sense of how you go to the bottom line that is pretty obvious and should have come in the debate, but the way you bring the process or the narrative is something that no one uh, would expect. Now, generally, I would say that being creative in debate is a process of trial and error, meaning that you would rather practice it and you might get a glorious fourth in practice while doing that because you might turn out to be off flesh or you might turn out to prove something that is not necessarily logical. But I think that practice makes perfect, and I think you should use practices, not necessarily tournaments, although I, as a judge, would appreciate creative arguments um, in order to gain this um, skill. So let's start with why I think you should be creative. So in the debate itself, I think that this is especially something that can be useful for motions that are different, motions that are not your generic ban or not your generic policy. Uh, I call them the Michael Shapiro school of motions, uh, the kind of motion that you don't know what's coming. And I think it's better to think about motions as not being generic. Secondly, because you might get credit with certain judges. Um, why? Because you made their day less boring and you brought something else. Uh, to the debate and you've shown that you can be clever. Uh, also, if you're first half, I would recommend many times going to the basic bottom lines but doing it in another way because then it can confuse your opponents. They won't know what kind of link to attack because they didn't see it coming, meaning that they would have a harder time refuting you. And if you're second half, this is especially useful if you have a very good first half and you need to come up with a way to show something that is more important, something that is different, or maybe narrowing the strategy of the debate if they simply pour a lot of material and you find yourself in a need to do something uh, something different. And also a good reason is because it's fun. And why should you do it in real life? A, once again, it's fun. And I think that it gives you good life skills in the sense that you can use it anywhere else. Now for the purpose of this workshop, I will divide my tips according to kind of time periods of the debate that can be applicable. So I will start with prior to the debate, meaning things that you do at home, then during prep time, and then during the debate itself. Now, there is a lot of similarity between the prep and the debate itself in general lines, but I did make this distinction because I think there are specific things that one should look at, and I think that it's important to flag that, and I will also try to point that out. So let's start with prior to the debate, because I think that creativity starts even before the game starts. And I think that the basis for any kind of creative thinking is having general knowledge. and as broad as general knowledge than you can have. Now, I have a cognitive research to back me up on that, that says basically that thinking creatively is the ability to connect between different dots and different pieces of information that you have in a way that no one thought about before. So here, I would recommend to read as much as possible about things that are not only the economist and are happening in the world, because most debaters do that. But I would also suggest to read things that are even pop culture or things that no one would have thought of 
And here I have some nice examples of even a caricature that I saw in a newspaper, and it was about the environment, and it says, so we've created a better world for nothing because global warming doesn't exist. And this gave me an idea of the fact that it may not be bad, even if global warming doesn't exist, to still continue doing things that are eco-friendly, meaning that I could rebut better any idea that would try to deny. So I think that you should generally open your eyes and ears to everything that you hear and adopt the mentality of, hmm, that sounds interesting. Maybe I can use it in a debate and pretty much mentally store it. Um, also, another thing that I came to, to know and use is a, a court ruling about Israeli courts that do not evict scouters, uh, people that invade houses after a certain period of time. Squatters. Squatters, sorry. Um, after a certain period of time, because they assume that the landlord didn't care enough about the property. If he would have, then he would have reached the court in the term of a year or two years. And from that, I could use it as an argumentation about the government nationalizing property that is not being used according to the logic of that court ruling. So here I connected this piece of information that I had in order to show off a more broader logic that applied to that, uh, to that debate. Now, I would also recommend to know a bit of theories and concepts that have to do with sociology, anthropology, psychology, not only because I study that, uh, but because I think that this many times helps us with thinking about processes and how societies work, how people think, in a way that can be more creative because most debaters do study philosophy or economics, uh, the classic PPE. And I think that knowing words like sublimation, uh, different forms of capital, uh, a good enough mother, uh, the concept of history, uh, according to different philosophers, is something that can help us think of how societies uh, work generally. Now, how do you enlarge your general knowledge? So, first of all, there is the reading of uh, different things on debaters' list. You can see Oxford has a very good list of things to read. Now, this contains a lot, so the thing I would recommend is if you have a debate that you didn't know a lot about, after the debate, go and teach yourself a bit about generally the topic that the debate was on. That way, it doesn't feel like it's too much, but already when next time you encounter that subject, you have more information uh, on it. Also, I would go to different podcasts or YouTube channels. Uh, I listen to those while doing the dishes. I find that it's very stimulating and my house is cleaner because I have an incentive <laughs> uh, to listen and learn about debate things. Uh, so here, of course, you have TED Talks. Uh, I recommend Crash Course, which is really nice. It gives you basic concepts about history, about economy, uh, and uh, psychology. Uh, you have PBS Idea Channel, which analyzes uh, pop culture phenomena in a creative way. Uh, you have Journeyman Pictures for documentaries, uh, which I find really interesting. Usually, they're not about 20 minutes of a documentary, and they have to do with different phenomena all over the world, uh, so you can do those. Also, I recommend talking to people. Now, this might sound funny, but use the fact that you go to international debate tournaments and that you meet very interesting and clever people from all over the world, and ask questions. Be curious, so ask them about the place they come from, ask them about things that you might have heard about the country, things that might help you and that are also interesting on the way. So a better person, you, you have more friends, and you become a better debater. So you have everything you want just by using people. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> okay, so uh, now we go on to more general ways of thinking that have to do with the debate itself. So during the prep time and the debate. So let's start with the things I don't recommend you to do. Often we have the temptation to simply see emotion and think, hmm, I've done that before. I know about this topic. Yeah, I've done something similar. Fight. I've done it before is your greatest enemy. Look at the motion as if you're debating it 
in you. And don't assume that things that you've done previously or things that you've heard other people do is necessarily relevant to the debate. Because many times you would miss out on key words in the motion that make it unique or make it different from the things you've heard before. Or many times you don't give yourself the chance to come up with something that might be new or to come up with argumentations that other people would bring up but wasn't brought up in the previous debate that you've made. So pretty much push yourself into thinking about new things and not going for the generic kind of junior type of analysis that we all know. So what do you do? I think there are two ways of thinking. And this has to do also with what I described in the beginning about the forms of creating. So the first one is thinking in an inductive way. What does it mean? It has to do with what do I prove? And here I would recommend coming up with a crazy idea or association and then trying to see how this fits into the motion, into the things that you need to prove. So you start off with simply random association and things that come up when reading the motion or you think can be relevant, and then seeing how this can be applicable to, uh, to the debate. Here I can give an example of, we had a motion about conducting virtual wars, and it had to do with redistribution of resources. And during prep, I thought about generally wars and I, and I told myself that most wars today are civil wars or ethnic wars, meaning that resources are not a big part of it. And if I look at the debate from that kind of prism and I see how the virtual wars impact that, I might have more chances of winning because it would give me a more realistic way to approach the motion and to rebut the things that have come previously. So this was just by thinking about wars and what I know about wars in general and then making it applicable to the debate. Do notice that this might mean that you would be less focused on the clashes themselves, on the verdicts. Here I would recommend using your partner. And if you know that you are the more creative person or that your partner is the more creative person, have him ask you the questions of how is this relevant? Where would this fit in? How do you think that you can win the debate with this? Is this an example? Is this a process? And with him making the process of actually structuring your crazy ideas into an actual speech that can win and dividing the burden among yourself. The second way of thinking is a way of deduction. And I think this has to be more with how do I prove the things that all of us in the debate want to prove. So here, I would start with asking myself, what are the clashes in the debate? What do I foresee that is going to come? What are the burdens? And then trying to think of how I can reach the generic bottom line in a different way. So here, I would think that if my burden is to prove that schools are effective in conveying a message, to try and think of what is specific about this thing that we are teaching that makes schools more effective when it comes to that and trying to find a different means of getting to the bottom line uh, of that. Now, when you compare between the two ways, I can't say that there is one way that is better than the other. I think it's very individual and has to do with the way you think. So choose one, stick to it. If you can make sure that your partner knows how to balance you, or at least tell him how you think, and then if you can combine the two methods, I think it would be the best. If you have one that thinks about the questions and one that thinks about details, it would probably be the best mix. If not, be aware of the way you think and try to adapt your prep accordingly. Now, a means of thinking is has a lot to do with associations. So here, the associations can be regarding the specific words in the motion, thinking why the 18 chose those words and not other words. Here I can give the example of, we had the motion of this house believes that the Tea Party creates a better world for liberals. And here I think that the for liberals is something that can give you an edge. Because what I read in the debate is that I need to prove that liberals will be happy, not necessarily the entire society. 
Now, since the Tea Party wants to get, give more autonomy to different states, and I know that there are states that are more liberal and states that have more conservatives, the more liberal states would bring about a better life for the liberals, meaning that on my side, liberals are happier of the Tea Party, meaning that I was able to use this kind of association in order to get to something that is very specific to the motion. Also, you can have association to the general topic of the motion. Here we had uh, in Copenhagen a motion about capping the amount of clothes that a person can have. Now, this might sound very weird, but going into the motion, I suddenly remembered that Lucinda Davis once told me that in Sweden, they have this cultural concept called logo, meaning that they try to live life in a modest way. And she told me that people don't buy a lot of clothes. And even if they do, they buy the same kind of shirt in order for others not to know that they own many clothes. So I was able to use the concept of logon in order to show that by capping the amount of clothes, we are reaching an ideal of modesty and of judging people more according to who they are and not according to the things they buy. And all of this just from association to what Lucinda Davis once told me that had to do with clothes in Sweden. So you can use those kinds of information. Also, uh, you can think about different actors that are influenced by the motion and the associations that you have with them. So if we're talking about um, giving uh, the, uh, the ability to organizations to pay women in order not to abort, then you can think about how those actors will be influenced. And maybe you are pacifying them in a way that is not only beneficial for the women that might now get the money, which is probably the obvious case, but to say how those organizations are the ones to win you the debate by showing that you can pacify them into uh, into more live and let die approach when they feel like the government is not going against them necessarily. Now, also another thing that you can do in the prep is ask yourself different questions. So. I would try and maybe go against some of the assumptions that are at the hearts of motions or at the hearts of cases and trying to show that those assumptions are, are wrong. Uh, so an example for that would be in debates about reparations that we got a POI asking why should citizens be punished for a crime that they didn't necessarily uh, commit. And here, the assumption that they have is that reparation is a punishment. If you go against that assumption and show you have a much stronger case because their logic of reparations being a form of punishing people isn't something that stands. And if it is not seen as a punishment, it can do more benefits in society. People can perceive it in a different way, meaning that they will, they will be willing to pay the reparation because it is not such a burden on them. Now here I would also ask myself questions that might seem stupid, but don't, don't be afraid of it. Ask yourself things that m might seem obvious, but will bring about to more interesting questions. Like, why is it important for people to necessarily obey any rule? Why is that so important that the government has a monopoly over violence? Or um, why is it so important that people have equal access to services like lawyers? Why is that a thing? How does that come across in real life? What is it about different uh, languages and minority languages that makes dictators oppress them? What's there to fear of? And this can bring you interesting answers that would bring a more interesting question that would start from a lower point of disagreement with the other side, meaning that it would be much harder for them to refute the things you say because you come from a very different approach and you don't agree with them on things that they were sure you would agree upon. Another thing to have in mind is to constantly think about alternative scenarios and try to dismantle dichotomies. Many times 
people in debate would try to portray reality as though there is two options only. Either you do this or you do that. I say go against it. If you can find a different alternative or something else that would happen, this would be a much more creative argument. Here the example that I have is there was a motion about Serbian foreign policy and whether the Serbians should go with the West and receive help from them. Now you'd think that the dichotomy is either receive help from the West or receive help from Russia, which is their ally. Here, based on the historical knowledge that I had, I remembered that in the Yugoslav period, they were independent. They weren't officially allies, not of the communist bloc and not of the Western bloc. And because of that, they were able to achieve a lot. And their passport was one of the most coveted in the world because they didn't have any trouble with anyone. So what I presented in that debate is the third option of returning to the Yugoslav policy of not being friends with anyone, therefore having everyone competing on your race and the things that you yourself might contribute them on specific policies and not as a general rule of policy. Another interesting uh, debate that I had here is about uh, Koreas. It was about the US and not helping South Korea uh, or, or giving it nuclear weapons. Here, I, rem I, rem I, I remember that there were already negotiations between the South and the North, and they even won a Nobel Prize for it. So what I suggested is that in order for those negotiations to continue on happening, you need to have a good cup and a bad cup. And when the bad cup can be the US and the good cup can be South Korea, you'd have a much better way to negotiate with the North, which isn't the dichotomy of either you have the US on your side or not doing anything at all, but you have the US doing something that gives you an edge in reaching a whole different goal, which is not protecting yourself, but actually coming up with a peace agreement. Another technique is using um, an example that you might have during the prep and building your case uh, around that. So in the motion of three strikes you're out, my partner and I knew that we were extending on a good team, and the example that we had in mind was gangs. So we built an entire case about gangs and how they would be influenced by three strikes you're out and how this breaks their uh, modus operandi and how this is the only way to bring about to a safer environment in many places. And it was through that example that we came up with something creative that eventually won us the motion. Or in the motion that we had in Euros about uh, the families of people that died in tragedies and will they give information or not, the example that we had was about the German wings pilot and the fact that there was a debate of whether we should publish the fact that he was depressed. And we use this in order to show what are the likely scenarios that will occur in this debate and why we think that this is especially important because this has to do with safety regulation, this has to do with combating stigmas about mental illness. And we had an entire case simply built around this, uh, this example. Another interesting example is uh, laws against sexual harassment uh, that you can often use in debate because those laws were very unpopular back in the day and they, um, they were legislated despite the public not willing them. And now if you do a survey, you would see that most people are for and they see sexual harassment as a crime meaning that you have your, an interesting example of how legislation can shape reality and not necessarily the other way around, which can be used in many debates if you have this example uh, in, uh, in your head. Um, another technique that you might have is using analogies. And here this might be tricky because you need to remember constantly to show why this is uh, analogous to what you're trying to show. But if you're able to see some sort of resemblance, something pops into your head and you say, this reminds me of a different case and make the analogy in the debate, this can be very strong. 
So here there is an example of um, thought experiment in which if you do a debate about animal rights and you try to establish whether human beings have more rights and whether it is moral to harm someone else, try to think about the example of aliens. Let's say aliens that now have more intelligence than we do invade Earth. Do they have the right to harm us as human beings just because they are more intelligent? And according to that, to build your case. Or another interesting example is the idea of gene uh, modification in human beings. So we already know by association that we alter genes, right? Where do we do it? We do it with plants. There is genetically modified food. So if you try to make the analogy, the thing that people are most afraid about genetically modified food is that there would be a change in which one day we won't be able to solve if something goes bad. Let's say there is a new disease in the plant. Let's say we no longer have the money to buy the GM seeds, and so on. Now, you can also say the same thing about human beings. Let's say you cure a certain disease in one person by altering their genes, and they now have children that have the same sick gene, and you cure it once again, and you do it all over and all over. But then one day, you don't have the money to cure them. You have a lot of mankind, a lot of humanity, that now might die because you don't have the means of changing their genes, which sounds like a very scary idea, even more scary than not having plants. So this is an interesting analogy that comes just by thinking about when do we change genes and is there something that is similar to that. Another technique that I use, I call it the that's actually a good idea, uh, which means that you can think about what the other side says. Completely agree with their entire process of thought, but just make sure that what they say is bad is actually a good thing that would lead to the outcome that you yourself want. Now, how can this be? It can be in the immediate aftermath of the thing that is going to happen. So in the motion that we had about taxation and uh, inheritance tax and taxing everything, uh, we had an opposition, a claim that said that now rich people would spend more money when they're alive and because they wouldn't want to give it to the state. So here, if you use this technique, you say, this is actually a good thing. Because if you spend more money when you're alive, it means that you get the economy going, right? Because you now purchase more goods. You create more demand for other things that will happen. You consume more services. There are more people that would now work for you because the money won't be left in the bank. It would be doing something more positive for society. So that's actually a very good thing. And that's a means of showing that. This can also be a good thing in the long run, not necessarily in the short run, or the new problem that would arise would be a problem that we might handle in a better situation. So if you take the example of the debate about the Hannibal's procedure, uh, in which you shoot a soldier from your army that is suspected of being kidnapped, then one side might say that this would lead to more attempts to make terror attacks on civilians instead of trying to kidnap, because kidnapping is now not worth it so much. But that's actually a very good thing, because we have more experience in dealing with ordinary terror attacks, because you have uh, different security guards, you have checkpoints, you have information about ticking bombs, meaning that you would save all in all more lives even if they try to uh, create more terror attacks and not kidnap soldiers. Um, this can also be in the case of uh, maybe creating a different response, meaning that something bad will happen, you agree, but the bad thing will create an even better response from other key players in the motion. So what do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. Let's say that we, uh, we allow more competition in the 
drug market. And we allow people that do things that don't really heal people to claim that they have that effect. You can say that this motivates more proper science that now wants to rebut the things that we hear. And now you will actually have more means of testing and more of an incentive to try and figure out what kind of drugs are good and what kind of drugs are bad. Or if we take the debate of splitting up the LGBTQ movement into all of the different letters and having them for their own cause. Now you can accept the fact that now there would be less people in each struggle, but since there would be less people, but, and now they also have a more focused struggle, you can say that this is actually a very good thing because it will motivate people to come and join that struggle because now they know what that struggle is and now they feel like they owe more the type of community that they belong to that is more like them, meaning that you create more empathy and all in all more struggles, meaning that everyone wins. So this can also be a good thing. Another technique is to try and make life harder for yourself and prove that whatever your opponent wants to happen will also happen on your side via the policy that you are defending or via the idea that you are defending. So if we take the motion about the Confederacy flag and whether we should ban it or not, you can say that it would be easier to reclaim the Confederate flag instead of banning it. And this is something that would happen in a greater likelihood in the status quo instead of via, a, via the ban. Also in the motion that we had in Euros about using coercion and deceit in order to get intelligence. So you can say that even in the moral clash of this is something wrong to do, that actually deceiving people into giving information is more moral. Why? Because if you deceive someone, he doesn't know that he's giving away information. He doesn't know that he's a traitor, meaning that he himself doesn't feel bad, but moreover than that, there are less chances of him discriminating himself. And there are less chances of maybe the Hamas government finding out that he has given information, meaning that they won't kill him as a traitor because no one knows, because he was, uh, he was cursed into doing that. Meaning that even on the moral flesh, you can find something creative to say, and I would try and go the extra mile to prove those things instead of simply assuming that side opposition necessarily wins the moral clash. Now, generally thinking, I would say don't be afraid to go full out with your principle, especially if you're a first prop. I say accept the damages, but go for the bolder case. You can try to hedge over and mitigate all the dangers, but A, it's a bit boring. B, it's very hard to come up with all the things that can be attacked. So I would try and go with a more broader principle and defend a concept and say that you know that this might be a revolutionary thing. You know that this might have drawbacks, but you think that all in all, a world with that concept is a better one. And here, I think that there is the example of giving uh, licensing for parenthood. You can say that there are certain people that shouldn't be parents, but I think everyone would agree. Or you can go full out on the principle and say, no, we want only people that are really good to be parents, and that's what we're going to defend and try to show why a world in which you can control who has children is a better one, and not only talk about specific cases that might fit in. Also, in the case of um, allowing people to commit suicide and assisting them. I think that you can go full out and say that even remaining alive is irrational, meaning that you don't really need to preserve life and there is a huge assumption on the other side that life is something that is worth valuing. I would go for there isn't really a difference, therefore we as a government shouldn't ban people from trying to take their own lives 
or should assist them in the case that they want to, meaning that now you have a stronger case. Also, I would suggest generally, don't be afraid of having crazy cases, uh, especially if you're first up. Why? Because then it hurts your second up, because they have to go with the craziness and they cannot contradict you. And also because I think that no one would expect that. So what do I mean by that? There was a motion about teaching kids in former uh, colonial uh, countries uh, English and having all of their school courses in English. First, op can say, no, it should be in their own language and explain why English is bad. Or first, op can go crazy and say, you know what, we agree that they should all have one language. We just think that that language should be Chinese Mandarin. And then have a whole different debate, which no one else expected, which at least could be fun. And if you do it well, <laughs> and if you do it well, it can be a winning case. So, yeah, for leader opposition, it would necessarily be fun. You know, I, I'm for the side who says uh, the crazy, the crazy thing. You don't Also, I would say, don't be afraid of being provocative. Not in the sense of offending people or saying things that go against certain groups, but in the sense of saying things that are not necessarily popular, like going against democracy. Who says democracy is such a good thing? It's quite provocative to say that maybe it's not, but it can win you a debate if you do it well enough. So don't be afraid of that. Now, specific things that you can put your emphasis on during prep time. So as I've already mentioned, use the fact that you have a partner and that you're not alone. This can be used, A, in coming up with ideas. Uh, it means that you have a more of a group intelligence thing in which you have more ideas and more things that you can bring to the table. But also the idea of checks and balances. Making sure that you don't do things that are too extreme on the creative side, but are not too boring on the structural generic way that you should debate. And here, I think that it's very individual in the sense of how you work with your partner, but do try to be aware of how you operate, what's the best way to work with you, and let your partner at least know of that. Um, and if you're not a creative person, maybe tell your partner to come up with the more creative things and you do the other, uh, the other part. Specific things that you can do in the debate itself. So generally there are all the tips and methods that I gave you of how to think, but I would also recommend to improvise more. Now here uh, I think that this might be a challenge and this mostly has to do with people that are extension speakers. Uh, sometimes a uh, thing that I do is I listen carefully to the debate and I see how it unfolds. Now during that time I may not develop all the arguments and the ideas that we had, but what I think this does give me is it gives me the ability to get more ideas as the debate unfolds. I might hear a certain word that came up in opposition that might trigger an idea, or I might see that the debate is going elsewhere, meaning that I should adapt and I should try and improvise, maybe shift the clash, maybe prove things in another way, which I think is very important. And also, you can understand what was lacking in your prep by seeing the, the debate. I think that many times by seeing the faults of other people, it can give you the idea of what is the missing link, where do I fit, and I think that this is something very important. Now, this might give you less time to develop. I usually start developing, if I get the general idea after two speakers, maybe three. Uh, but I think that this room for maneuvering is something that is very good. Do notice that you need to communicate to your web speaker what you're going to talk about and not to cause them a heart attack. So although this has happened in the past, <laughs> I, I did it to some of my... <laughs> Genuine hub? A small, 
but if you have a good group speaker, then simply tell him to listen carefully to what you say. If not, then try to find um, like small shortcuts or means of communicating what you want or maybe indicating that you are going a certain way with a certain idea that, uh, that you have. And basically, that's it. I have more examples, but if you want a question. So if you're in Top Hop and you come up with a creative case, um, would you also recommend running the standard stuff briefly as well, just so your bottom half of the uh, So it depends. If your crazy case has a way of making the generic things redundant, then I would state that. I would say that, e that either you concede that the generic things will not happen, therefore no one can do it after you, or saying that what you're bringing up is so much more important or more realistic that the generic stuff is irrelevant and if Prop tries to argue about that, of course you can rebut it, but that's not the debate. And then try to shift the burden to them. More questions? Uh, so, you actually pretty much described my prep plan with Desi. Uh, there was this thing when you are a pretty good team and you are bottom half that I found really helpful, just walking around for two to three minutes and always think there has to be something else. There has to be something else. And this is sometimes when you come up with the best ideas and the worst ideas, you then need a good team partner who can distinguish that. But um, this forcing yourself to think that there has to be something else um, is, I think, as helpful as in the beginning not assuming that you already know the debate. You shouldn't think after the, your prep time that you already know the debate as well. And that has helped me a lot to actually come up with one or two ideas that might help or might not help, but that Desi could choose from. Yeah, uh, I agree. I even suggest doing that if you have a bit of time left, and let's say you're first half and you're the second speaker, and you know that already your partner is developing his case, you still have about a minute or two to think of Maybe they, they'll say something else. Maybe I can put it from a different angle. And use the fact that you have time and that nothing is too urgent in order to come up with more creative things and try to steal them away from the second half. We're all good. What? We are all good. Great. So that's it.